Please be seated. I'm going to read a scripture to you that I believe will encourage you. We have some brothers and sisters in the congregation who are going to share with us a few practical matters about leading and serving a Bible talk. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. Now we ask, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. The scriptures here encourage us to give our respect to those who work hard among us. And I believe that these disciples that are going to share their hearts with you tonight are some of the most hard-working brothers and sisters I know in our ministry. Not to say that many of you aren't also very hard workers, but I know that tonight we're going to hear some great things from the hearts of our brothers and sisters. Uh, the first couple we're going to hear from is our very own Josiah and Christy Smith. Without further ado, come on up, guys, and they're going to share their hearts with us right now. Amen? Amen. kind of talk. <laughs> well, greetings from the Phoenix International Christian Church Arts, Media, and Sports Ministry. Right. In case you don't know, my name is Josiah, and this lovely lady is my wife, the mother of my child, my partner in the gospel, my best friend, and so much more, <laughs> Christian. <laughs> and we have the privilege to speak to you guys today about Bible Talk Atmosphere. Now, I was glad he was giving this topic because, you know, for one, we know the Super Bowl is in like two weeks, right? Everybody's fired up in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Everybody's excited. What I love about the Super Bowl parties is the awesome atmosphere is almost undeniable. When you come inside, you see the, the, the wings, the pizzas, the sodas. You see the people excited to watch the game, the commercials. You see people just excited. And just to, just to be in the fellowship of one another. It doesn't matter if you have a small place, a big place. People get very excited about that. We're here to talk tonight and give you three short points about how to make your Bible talk atmosphere awesome. Amen? Amen. Let's turn to uh, John chapter 13. As our first point is love. There needs to be love in the atmosphere at Bible talk. And I'm not talking about Valentine's Day love. I'm talking about that agape love, that love from brothers and sisters, love as disciples. And starting at verse 34, we're familiar with this one. It says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Amen? Amen. You know, I'm genuinely excited every single week when I come to Bible Talk to see my brothers and sisters. Are you excited to see the people in your Bible Talk? Do you show up happy to see them, or do you show up like it's just another thing you're coming to? Because when, we're, when, when that love is in the atmosphere, when we're showing up that way, there, there should be a joy between each one of us. When we see each other, the way we greet each other, you can almost tell if a person is not going spiritually well by the way they hug. Love. You got to be excited to see your brothers and sisters. I'm excited for that. We got to be genuinely excited to see the guests that are coming inside of our homes, inside of our places. I mean, we go out to put this work in to invite people to come out. And then when they show up, sometimes we don't even get up and go and greet them at the door. We've got to be excited to see the guests that come into our Bible talk. Because what's awesome is that people want to, like fraternities, for example, people want to join fraternities because they see the brotherhood. They see something and they want to be a part of that. People will become disciples when they see the love that we have for one another. They want to be a part of that. They want love because that's probably something that's avoid this in their life. So the love has to be in the atmosphere. We have to genuinely love and like each other. First Thessalonians 5.11, it says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Are you loving each other by the way you speak to one another at Bible Talk? 
I think too often we can come inside and, 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 and fail to realize that the way that we speak to each other, if we're not building each other up, we're not loving each other, we are tearing each other down and we're doing that in front of potential brothers and sisters. Too often we can come in and, and, and make these jokes that we think is just kind of funny. Oh, bro, your car stinks. You need to get that clean. Wow. Sis, you are always late. Like, we're not, we shouldn't be talking like that in front of our guests. Yeah. We have to say things to build each other up. We have to, hey, you know that sister? Oh, Paula Dean, she's awesome. She loves to cook. You like to cook? She likes to cook. You guys should get together. Yeah. Oh, that's right. She likes working on his car. You like working in the car. You guys should get together. See, when you start to build each other up, what you're doing is you're making it easy for a person to want to study the Bible with the people that surround you. I'm going to let my wife show a little bit on this. All right, I'm really, I'm really excited about this topic because atmosphere is one of the areas where ladies, I feel like, we can really have fun with. It's one of my favorite things about Bible talk. And so when I found out this is our topic, I was like, yes, because we have by no stretch of the imagination mastered anything. But uh, there are a few things that have worked with us for us that I'm excited to share with you guys. So um, think of a place where you feel at home. And now think of what are some characteristics about that place that make you feel that way. Okay, in the interest of time, we don't have time to like close eyes and visualize and everything, but when you get those things, try and incorporate those same things to your Bible talk. Uh, my husband and I went to um, this resort called Estancia in San Diego uh, for his last birthday. We went to uh, Priceline, one of those express deals where you like pay and then they tell you where you're going afterwards. They give you like a really good deal and then they're like, surprise, you're going to Estancia. Well, we went and I remember we walked in the door and they gave us champagne right away. And we were, I was like, I feel so special. I was like a little sham. I felt so awesome. And it was just the beginning, right when we came through the door. Don't offer your guest champagne at Bible Talk. But <laughs> what I'm saying is, when they walk through the door, now don't ambush them with a beverage, but people usually want a beverage when they come through the door. So look for that opportune time to offer them a beverage, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. It may sound simple, but this is important, and I've seen it not happen. Um, another thing, uh, we went to have breakfast, um, same, same place. And we, it was daytime, it was morning before church actually, and we went to this little table and had a candle in the middle of the table. It was daytime, it was morning, but the candle was burning. That makes me feel special. I don't care if it's night, day, whatever. I love the candle. That's something we do in our Bible talk. It's, the lights are on, but the candles are on too. And it just helps our, our place feel warm and fuzzy. Um, in the lobby, you'll never see a lobby without music on. We choose reggae music at Bible Talk, a little island flavor, not too loud, not too quiet. Doesn't it, you know, top 40 can get a little crazy, you're scared, you know, you know, but reggae is very consistent, it's very happy, it's very uplifting. It's something that may be in the background, but it adds to the ambiance. Yeah, yeah. At 1 John 3.18 says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So sisters, I encourage you to take action to create a loving ambiance where you feel really, really loved and happy in your Bible talk uh, to create a loving atmosphere. Amen. I think another thing is very, very important. Great job, man. Another thing is very important is that the service. There needs to be an atmosphere that's filled with service. Because again, this is not a, another thing that we're showing up to like, okay, you know, where do I sit? Well, you know, we need to become, we need to come to these things prepared to serve. If you turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2, you know, it talks about imitating Christ's humility in this. And I love how in starting in verse 3, I'm going to read 3 and 4 for us. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. You know, what's awesome about this is that this helps me realize that especially at Bible Talk, we have to have an outward focus. You know, we're not coming to Bible Talk to see what we can get out of it, what food we can get, what fellowship we can get. We're coming to bring that. We're coming to serve and to love our guests as they're coming and they're showing up. So we have to have an outward focus at Bible Talk and an extra level of considering others. Um, in Luke chapter 14, I just want to read this passage here. In Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 7, it says, When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, 
Do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you were invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Does this, is this anybody in Bible talk? Do you show up and, 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 and think that, you know, it's just all about you? Oh, I'm coming to get dinner. I'm coming to eat tonight. I'm going to throw down. I'm coming to where, where, where should I sit? Where should I sit at? Because I'm a disciple and I know what Bible talk is all about. Um, <clears throat> I wrote a few things down. And if you, if you find yourself doing these things, please stop. <laughs> please. <laughs> If you sit in the best or the most comfortable seats at Bible Talk and you're not a guest or a sister, you need to stop being selfish and start considering others. If you're sitting in a chair and a guest is sitting on the floor, you need to stop being selfish and start considering others. If your house, if you're hosting and your house is burning hot, guests are sweating and you're okay with that because you're saving money on the AC bill, you need to stop being selfish and start considering others. If you're more worried about your house getting a little messed up as opposed to the disciples and the guests that are in your home feeling comfortable and loved, you need to stop being selfish and start considering others. If you're not prepared to not eat at Bible Talk so that every guest get a chance to make a plate, you need to stop being selfish and start considering others. I'm going to let my wife share. Awesome. All right, sisters, I think this is a, it's an incredible honor to be a co-leader at Bible Talk. And I feel like serving, having a serving atmosphere at Bible Talk is something that we can be champions at. I, I really, really love it. Proverbs 31, 27, a wife of noble character. It says she watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. We are nurturers by nature. We, as noble women, we are to watch over our household. And Bible talk is a perfect opportunity to practice this. It's a perfect opportunity to exemplify this. Um, one way that uh, my husband and I have found that helps our mind and filters down to our heart is we call the people who come to our Bible talk guests as opposed to visitors. There's nothing wrong with the term visitors, but to us, visitors is someone who stops by. Guests to us are someone who is welcomed in. So just calling them guests really helps us get that mindset of these are guests into our home. Let's treat them as such or as so. Um, making sure the presentation is awesome. So Pauline always te teases me about this because I don't believe in putting out plastic containers. If someone brings something like a sour cream in a plastic container, you don't just put the sour cream out and you put it in a nice pretty bowl. To me, it's very important to put pretty, you know, I'm not judging, you put plastic containers, I'm just saying this works for us. Okay. Because let me tell you, you don't go to the Ritz Carlton and see a daisy sour cream thing out there. Because that is ghetto at the Ritz Carlton. It is. So, if that's not okay for the Ritz Carlton, I don't think that should be okay at our Bible talk. I want people to feel special. I want people to feel loved at our Bible talk. So as a way of serving, to me, I feel like it's really, really helpful to present the, the food layout in a very organized, pretty, happy way. Do you guys agree? Yes. Okay, amen. Um, I, has anyone ever waitressed before? I waitressed a lot, and one thing that, um, I, you learn like in the beginning of waitress, waitressing or serving, if you're a guy, is to um, anticipate the needs of your guests, right? So like you don't wait till the water's empty to fill it, you wait till it's like half done, then you anticipate the need and then you fill it, you know? Stuff like that. It's very important to anticipate the needs of your Bible talk. I know I can be a little like net control freak by nature, so I'm kind of like doo -doo 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 all the time anyway, but it's very important to have uh, that skill to know what's going on in your Bible talk and like a not obvious but know what everyone's doing and who doesn't have something to drink who if you haven't ladies if you haven't ever offered your Bible talk leader something to drink you need to do that if Josiah doesn't have something maybe he wants coffee he's busy he has a lesson plan he has things going on how can I help him the best maybe he wants coffee hey babe can I get you some coffee that's something that's something really little that I think what can go a long way um and uh, yeah, that's it, because in the interest of time, I just think we should be hostess with the mostest. <laughs> <laughs>
Awesome. We got a third point, but talk to me afterwards for that one for the interest of time. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Uh, we're going to talk about Bible talk lesson preparation. Please turn to Mark 1. Come on, bro. Mark 1, verses, uh, verse 34. Jesus prayed in a solitary place. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And then starting in verse 38, it says, Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. This is why I've come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and uh, driving out demons. You see here that Jesus prepared by starting out with God first. Amen. Amen. Uh, he had a great quiet time, Amen. probably a great prayer. Amen. And then he was able to uh, give his energies to travel, preaching village to village and driving out demons. Right. But the power came from God. So he didn't wait till uh, an hour before a Bible talk to prepare. Amen. Um, Mark two, skip over to Mark two, uh, thir- verse three through five. Some men came bringing to him a, a paralyzed man. Uh, carried by four of them since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd. They made an opening in the roof about, uh, above Jesus by digging through it and then lowering the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Wow. So you see here, the disciples, they brought their friends. Jesus brought his friends. There were so many friends that they had not enough room for anybody else. So the disciples made a hole in the roof so they could bring their friend and they could be, he could be with Jesus, right? Um, some practicals, uh, know your role, okay? Uh, let the visitors talk about the scriptures, right? Bible talk is not for you or for your disciples because you had a bad uh, quiet time in the morning. Amen. Uh, and, and you want to share your intellect and, and knowledge. Uh, uh, like these men, disciples, they, uh, they, brought, uh, they brought people to Bible talk. Um, and then when they were stuck, uh, they, they, moved, they moved to get him into the discussion. When our friends are stuck, that's when you're there to help uh, facilitate the discussion as well. Right. But then back off and let the, the visitors talk. Amen. Bible talk is for the visitors, so there isn't any people, uh, if, or if there isn't any people, you need to go get people, right? So if you don't have any uh, visitors, then, then take your Bible talk and go get visitors, amen? Uh, and Mark 2, uh, verse 7 through 12, it says, why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins by, uh, uh, but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he says to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. So the visitors uh, already had questions in their minds, did they not? Right? Um, so Jesus, uh, he prepared his Bible talk with questions. Right? Why are you thinking this way? Right? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. Right. He's already asking questions. Right. Jesus also kept his Bible talk very simple. How did he keep it simple? I um, I have authority to forgive sins. Get up and walk. (laughs) Kept it very simple. Amen. Uh, Jesus also gave the man something to do. He said, I tell you, get up and take your mat and go home. Right. He told him what to do. Right. The people were uh, encouraged when they left Bible talk. This, uh, this amazed everyone. They praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. They were excited and encouraged when they left. Amen. Yeah. Wow. Preparation uh, to facilitate the Bible talk. Bible talk leaders need to facilitate and ask questions like Jesus. That's what you got to do. Keep the discussion simple by sticking to one passage or one scripture with questions. Remember, simple, 
A lot of people, they've never read the Bible before when they come to your house. Um, or they've never heard it before. People come to Bible talk to hear Jesus' words uh, and, and, and use a parable or a teaching. Don't use your intellect, right? Use Jesus' words. What is Jesus trying to teach you tonight? That's what you got to ask. What is Jesus trying to teach you tonight? Uh, make sure that you give them something to do practically so they can change when they leave, right? I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Give them something, right? Tell them they are invited to, Bible to, uh, to study the Bible afterwards, right? That's what we're trying to do. Set up Bible studies afterwards, right? Because we want souls uh, to be saved. It, it's not uh, successful if you haven't called them to change. And make sure that people feel encouraged when they leave. Remember, Bible talk isn't about you and your amazing intellect. Matthew twenty two fourteen. for many are invited, but few are chosen. But Jesus chose you to prepare a uh, Bible talk like, uh, so that you can seek and save the lost. Amen? Amen. So um, I have the privilege and honor of being able to co-lead with Scott. And um, we also do a women's chemical recovery ministry oh on Saturday mornings. Um, so I have something for each of you. Whether um, If you co-lead a Bible talk, then this, this is kind of for you. Um, uh, as women, we don't do the lesson in, the, in there. So um, you may not be leading the discussion, but we have lots of opportunities to lead women to Christ. So the actual Bible talk prepares the hearts of the women. And what I'm doing is I'm like thinking about the conversations I'm going to be having. I listen intently to their answers. And then afterwards, like, I'm like, I'm going to have a conversation based on whatever it is they're commenting about or sharing. And I, I share about my life. And then I ask them to open up more. And then usually I even open another scripture and I share that with them. And it's a perfect segue into asking them to study the Bible. And, um, and they don't always want to right away. They, they might be like, that's just too much. I think I'll just come to Bible talk for a while. So, but just keep getting in there every time. It take, um, took me asking Linda Gonzalez many times before she studied the Bible. And um, we studied with her for a year and a half, actually. And that kind of goes into this next part where you don't just do the, the first principle studies for a year and a half. You know, like, if they're not ready, you have to be prepared to teach them in whatever areas that they need help in. So um, in 2 Timothy 4, 2, it says, Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So we worked really hard to mold and shape her heart and character to be sold out to God until she finally could crucify all these things. So we talked about Catholicism, we talked about sentimentality, we talked about um, confessing sin and really being real and honest, parenting, and anything that she needed help with, um, sharing her faith, trusting God, tithing. Um, and then it took great patience and careful instruction. So I was thinking ahead of time, what are we going to talk about and what scriptures am I going to have prepared? So in, you know, in, as far as lesson preparation... You as the, as the leader got to prepare ahead of time for those studies. It's not just, you know. So even when, um, when you go to Bible studies, it's not, we're not just going to do this as seeking God study. You know, it's not, we're just reading by the book and doing these studies. You have got to think through conversations you've had with them or situations you've seen them in or challenges you know that you're going to have to bring up to them, they're going to have to overcome. And you intertwine that into the study with however you're approaching whatever point and conviction that you're going to drive home. So that's, you know, lesson preparation as well. Um, and if you do lead a women's Bible talk or, you know, you have, you want to, um, read 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So we need to pray through the needs we want to correctly handle the word of truth when we're discipling somebody or preparing them. And when I'm preparing a lesson for CR, um, I really kind of think, and I try to approach the lesson from the needs of an addict and, and come at it from that perspective. Um, I want to teach the heart of discipleship. And, um, and then even um, during discussion or time when we're, we're, there's like interaction and praying about how else I can use the word to, to help them effectively. Um, get input. I get input from my female co-leader, which is Santana here, and it's awesome because she has input too on what direction the group needs help in, and um, 
So it's great we're doing some series on codependency right now, and it's really awesome. And then follow up afterwards, ask people, how did the lesson go? What do you think I can work on? I know I do that with Amy, or Amy does that with me. She calls me, what do you think I did? You know, how did the lesson go? And I just appreciate it because we always want to grow, like being, having progress. Now, maybe you don't lead a Bible talk, and maybe you're not in very many Bible studies right now, or whatever, but we still um, are encouraged to, um, to still lead. And Colossians 3.15, it says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. So even when I'm doing my quiet times, I'm thinking, who am I going to be able to share this with yeah. later? I'm thinking, I'm looking, going to look for opportunities. I do it all the time. I do it during fellowship break, at women's midweek, whether I'm just having a discussion with a sister at my house. I'm like, you know, that reminds me of a scripture I read in my quiet time when I share it with them. But I'm thinking ahead. How can I um, teach and admonish the women around me? Um, and the other thing that is really great and a good um, way for practicing is when you disciple someone, you prepare a lesson ahead of time for them, knowing, okay, they're really struggling with um, Pentecostalism or they want to know more about the Spirit. So just really study that out and then have a lesson for them. So, and then just lastly, when you're teaching, come from a place of vulnerability. Because people don't want to hear about how perfect you are and how you have all the great answers. They want to know how you've struggled and overcome. Amen. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Marvell Holder, and this is my awesome co-leader, Brittany Bullerin. And, and uh, we have the honor and privilege to uh, lead the campus ministry. You know... It's pretty awesome. Some, some awesome, some, in this awesome movement, some awesome guy had this awesome quote, and I don't know who it was, but he was awesome, and he said, sharing faith is evangelism, but follow-up is love. This evening, I'm, we're going to try to help you guys uh, learn how to, how to love people and go after follow-up, amen? amen? The three things you need is urgency, consistency, and effective planning. Turn with me to Mark 1. <coughs> In Mark 1, verse 16, and this first point will be urgency. In verse 16, it says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. You know, when we're, when we're reading the scripture, we can get focused on, you know, the, the response of the person that we're studying the Bible with. Like, are they going to respond immediately? But see right here in verse 20, it says, without delay, he called them and they left their father Zebedee. You see, Jesus didn't wait. Without delay, he called them. You see, you, you can't wait to, to ask somebody to study the Bible. You have to do it without delay. You can't focus on them responding with action immediately. You have to, you have to initiate the action. Amen? Amen? You have to strike while the iron's hot, and I'm going to let Brittany share. Awesome. Some practicals, as Marvell said, it's very important to set those studies up as soon as possible. Um, one thing that we started doing on campus this week, this is our campaign actually, is uh, we had the charge on Tuesday to set Bible studies up. That was our focus, set up Bible studies. And it was amazing to just see how much, how many people were so eager to set up a Bible study right on the spot. They didn't want to wait. They're like, no, no, get my number, set it up. Um, even setting up hangouts if people don't want to study the Bible. Also, this week, we shared with over a thousand people as our campus. It's crazy. It's crazy. And that number could mean nothing if we had no urgency for the people. So we went after that and we really went after setting up those Bible studies and I'll tell you the number at the end of how many studies we got. <laughs> well, awesome. The second thing is consistency. Let's turn to Acts 5. In Acts 5, we're going to pick up in verse 41. It says, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. This scripture is awesome. 
It says day after day they went from house to house. They had consistency. You see, I believe this is a, this is a place where a lot of disciples can fall short. Yeah. You see, we'll go out, we'll initiate all this stuff, and then there's no consistency. What we got to understand is when we talk to somebody about Jesus, you lit a, you lit a fire in their heart. Yes. There's a fire in there. Whether you see it, whether they're showing it, whether you know it or not, there's a fire in their heart. And you can't just let it burn out and be inconsistent. You know, you, you share faith and you'd be like, they're fired up. And then two weeks later, somebody's like, oh, how, how's it going? And Oh, well, they're, they're not open anymore. You let the fire burn out. What you got to do is you have to be very consistent. Study the Bible with a team and they'll, they'll, they'll teach you about this. You, you have to be very consistent. See, when you're consistent, what you're doing, what that is, is you're fanning into the flame. And if you keep being consistent and fanning into the flame, that flame will eventually become a blaze and they will be on fire for the Lord. Amen. And I'll let uh, Brittany share. All right. Some ways that we can keep that fire burning in people's hearts is that we can set something up every time we meet. So, for instance, you do a Bible study, sometimes as women we can get in the habit of, oh, well, I'll, I'll follow up and text her later and set the next study up. Or, well, you know, uh, did you, have you ever hang out with her? She's on discipleship. No, you know, I've just been studying with her. But get into that habit of being in their lives. Something we're trying to go after this semester is going to people's dorms, being in their, their personal life, seeing how they live, seeing their family, whatever way we can, consistently. So just because we do one Bible study a week, maybe, maybe we saw them three times that week. Um, the one cool thing the guys started doing, it's kind of funny, is they play ping pong. And so they're like always asking me, Mara, I was like, hey, 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 you want to play ping pong? Do you like ping pong? He's like, man, I'm going to beat you at some ping pong. You want to play pool? And it's funny because Marvell sucks at ping pong. So it's, if you make it sound like the most amazing game ever, if you make it sound like ping pong is a championship for the champions, like people want to come. People play ping pong with them because he makes it sound like it's the best game on the planet. So a way for us to be consistent as, as women is to be in people's lives and have fun. Amen. Our third point here is effective planning. Isaiah 32, verse 8. What it says is, a noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. You see, we, we, we call people in Acts 17 to be noble. Read your Bible every day, be noble. But we have to be noble and have a plan for them. We have to have a plan. You see, in, in, uh, in Jeremiah 29, Jesus had a plan for us. And it wasn't just some regular old plan. It was a plan to, for us to, to prosper, a plan for our future. You see, if you, have to, if you have a plan for someone, you have a vision for them. If you don't have a plan, you don't have a vision, and you don't really know where they're going to go. And, and see, we got to understand that when we don't have a vision for someone, we're blind, leading the blind. I'll let Brittany share here. Okay. So uh, this semester, we've really been going after effective planning. Our goal this year as a campus ministry is to baptize 45, or no, sorry, add 45 people to our number, whether it's yeah. baptism or restoration, because yes. we really want to go after restoring people, because that's not very common in our campus ministry. Yeah. Um, so one way we, we can do that is have a plan for people, as Marvell said, and something I've been going after with the women is have a planner. Have a schedule. Schedule your work, your kingdom stuff, your homework. But you know what? If we schedule all that stuff, but we don't schedule our follow-up, do we think that's important too? And so that's something that we've been going after. And one thing that's really cool that Marvell has is doing is going after picking days to follow up with people. So say we have 20 people, because we shared with 1,000 people, over 1,000 people this week. And all of us got a lot of numbers. And so it can be overwhelming to go, man, I got to share with 50 people and follow up with these people. And it can get overwhelming. But if you choose, OK, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm following up with these people. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I'm following up with these people. It makes the load so much lighter, and it can help you sift through the people who are actually open. Yeah. Also, at the beginning of this week, which was really cool, is we only had eight Bible studies in our campus ministry. But by today, the end of our campaign, we have 35 Bible studies. <laughs> because I know it's because people have given their hearts to going after yeah. being yeah. kings and queens of follow-up and making sure that we set those studies up on the spot. Come on. Right. Well, here it is. If you go after urgency, consistency, and effective planning, I'm pretty sure that everybody in here, your follow-up 
will soon turn into baptism. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Well, uh, my name is Rob Hamlin, and this is uh, my beautiful wife, Teresa. Come on. And uh, we're here to talk about discipling in the Bible talk. And I'm going to let Teresa share first. Well, I want to just start off in um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. And it says, um, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And um, we started leading this Bible talk um, that we're leading now in North Scottsdale about a year and a half ago. And one of the things um, we needed to start doing was just discipling the heart. And um, it was really a commitment, you know, commitment to the meetings of the body. And, um, and that's, it was just really helping the hearts of the disciples to um, put the kingdom first, the, helping their hearts to prioritize their life around the kingdom. And because um, most of our, our Bible talk is married with children. And so it was really just helping their hearts. And, and it's just amazing to see how much um, everyone's grown in that area, just to see their commitment and, and their love for, for the body of Christ. And then um, also just um, in our Bible talk, just trying to, you know, build people up by their strengths and help them to feel needed and important. And um, I just see like everyone in our Bible talk, they all have specific strengths. And as we um, really help them to and encourage them to use those, they want to give more and serve more. And um, it's just amazing. Like, um, I know we have the Schultz in our Bible talk now, and they're really thoughtful and thinking of people and like just the like food. I, I just um, who has allergies, who's a vegetarian. And it's just amazing just when the food's out, there's something for everyone. Just their, their thought, th- they're very thoughtful in um, the hearts of the people and um, who they help lead um, with us. And, and I think about JJ and Melinda. Um, JJ is an amazing cook. And he's constantly just wanting to serve in that way and bring people into his home. And we're so grateful just how they open up their home for us. And I think of, you know, Melinda, she just, she's a mom and she treats every child that comes into our Bible talk like her own. And it's just amazing just um, really seeing the strengths of everyone in the Bible talk and really building them up. And then all those needs in the Bible talk can be met by each and every disciple. Let's turn to John 17. We're going to look in uh, verse 20. And you know, the purpose of discipling and of the Bible talk is to build unity first and foremost with God. And then as we all move toward God, we'll be unified with each other. And as we're all unified with each other, people will see that we're from God. And this is, uh, we're going to look at Jesus' prayer. This is shortly before he gets taken away to go toward the cross. And this is a part of his prayer right here. In verse 20, he says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And right there, that's the key, through the message, through the word of God. It says that all of them may be one, Father, as you are in me. I'm sorry, as you are in Sorry, my eyes are not what the, I forgot my glasses up here. Okay, as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be, I'm going to just humble out and wear my wife's glasses here, guys. Just be patient with me. I got this. I got this, all right? Now I can see. Okay, I'm going to start verse 21. It says that all of them may be one father just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. And, you know, I heard at the uh, conference that the purpose of Bible talk is to baptize. If there's no unity, you're not going to have baptisms. Because they won't feel the love when they walk in the room. Discipling is what brings unity. You know, a couple practicals here. One, you got to love the people in your Bible talk. Do they feel love? So much of what people make, makes people feel loved is you sharing your life with them. Do people know you? Like, do you share your heart? Do you share your struggles? Do you share your challenges? Do you share your joys? Do they know who you are? That's so key. 
You know, in 1 Corinthians 8, I'll just quote it, it says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You know, another thing is you've got to, um, you've got to ask questions and listen to people. If you just come in with all the knowledge in the world and you, people are going to kind of zone out, so to speak. You know, there's a scripture, a great verse in Deuteronomy 13, 14. I'm just giving these scriptures. It talks about inquiring, probing, and investigating. Like, you got to be great. Like, I remember uh, about a year ago, a couple from our ministry came in and they said, you know, this is the last time we're going to be getting together. We're leaving the church. And I remember just, you know, that feeling that my heart would just start beating. It's like, oh, and my temptation so much was just to start talking and, oh, no, no. And I was like, okay. And I remember in my heart just praying a little bit and thinking, stay calm, listen, we can win their hearts. And I remember just asking questions and just listening for about 45 minutes and then using the word of God and talking to them. And they're like, yeah, we we did, you know, by the end of that D time, they're like, I don't know what we're thinking. Sorry, bro, you know, and they're doing awesome now. They're incredible servants in our church. So uh, another practical to discipling is speaking the truth in love. Yeah. You got it. If you just speak the truth and it's not in love, people aren't going to listen. They're not going to hear. I mean, they may because they love God, but it's going to be tough. And the key is so much of that part of love is using the scripture. Like you got to use the Bible when you disciple. You may be right when you say what you say, but if you're not... you. But if you just say, well, if they're not, their heart's not where they need to be, they're going to think, that's just that person sit, telling me. Right. But they're not going to say, if you open the Bible, they'll say, wow, this is God speaking. What can I say to that? So you got to use the scripture. And then you got to be consistent in training. And I'll be honest, brothers and sisters, this is something I really want to grow in this year myself, is really going after spending time with people and training them. If they're not great at sharing their faith, we got to go out and share our faith with them. Right. And really be with them and walk with them. And it'll build their confidence and it'll build the love and build the fun. So you got to really go after that. Let's uh, close out in John 17, verse 3. And this right here, verse 3, may be my favorite verse in the Bible. Get my glasses on here. All right. It says, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Amen. Eternal life is knowing God and knowing Jesus. And then in verse 4, it says, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Brothers and sisters, let's give God glory on earth by completing the work this year and really making a decision, especially one specific area that you want to grow in as a Bible talk leader to make your Bible talk greater. Amen? Amen. Yeah.